Danielle Piamelli is an Italian-born American scientist. He studied neuroscience at first Columbia University, then Rockefeller, contributing to future Nobel Prize-winning discoveries that arose from work he and others performed while there. Dr. Piamelli is currently at the University of California, Irvine School of Medicine, where he holds the joint appointments in anatomy and neurobiology, biological chemistry, and pharmacology. Dr. Piamelli has made important contributions to our understanding of biochemical pathways involved in the formation and activation of endocannabinoids, the brain's natural cannabinoids. Today, Dr. Piamelli is going to give us a primer on the cannabinoid system. Good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today. I, um, in the last couple of years, you know, working on uh, cannabinoids has become quite exciting, so I'm used to talk to audiences of all Types, but I think this is the first time I have a quadruped in my in my public. <laughs> I am particularly proud of that. Thank you so much for expanding my experience. And he's so excited now. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, we're talking about you. Who we are? Now, don't, don't tell me you're not smart. Don't tell me you're not smart. Anyway, so we are going to be talking about the cannabinoid system. And uh, if you were about my background, I've been uh, involved with this for. Uh, for a long time, uh, since uh, you know, our first paper in this was 1994, and it dates uh, me, but also dates the uh, uh, the extent of my uh, of my interest in this matter. Um, but as I alluded to before, uh, you know, my little introductory joke, I um, I moved from uh, I, I still am I'm a basic science and I do basic science, but more recently I I I, I have sort of started to also uh, take more of an educational role because of the, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, legalization of cannabis and, you know, all the questions that have been uh, asked as a result of the, of the legalization. Um, that's why I've been talking to audiences of all sorts in the, in the last couple of years. Anyway, today I, I will just stay focused on the science, but I'll give you a very, a very broad uh, a very, very broad view of the uh, neuroscience and the pharmacology of the cannabinoid system. I understand your background is in plant biology, not in neuroscience, not in, uh, in pharmacology. So my own means stop me if there is a concept that I just automatically give for granted. Uh, I'll be glad to uh, to explain if needed. So you don't need, I think, an explanation for this though, right? That's the plan we are talking about today. And I'd like to start off with a little bit of history. I think history is really key to understanding uh, the present, where we are right now, also where we are with, uh, with the cannabis plant. So in case you wonder, humans have known about cannabis for a long time. Um, we have data about that. We have archaeobotanical data. And we also have palynological data suggesting that humans have either gathered or cultivated and bred uh, cannabis for at least 8,000 years. Um, in Europe, in Eastern Europe, but throughout the world, in Japan, for example, as well, in, in China. And so this has been, this is a very, very long time. And we don't. We have not cultivated wine, the vine, the, you know, the grape vine, for as long. It's a shorter period of time. So our acquaintance with, uh, with with cannabis is long, but there's still a lot of gaps. And one of the things that you uh, find right away is that we have really started looking at cannabis from a scientific perspective only in the 19th century, 1845. A French author by the name of Jean-Jacques Moreau published a book uh, entitled uh, Cannabis and Mental Disease, it can, Cannabis et la Mentale, published in Paris in 1845. And it's really the introduction of cannabis to modern science. Before that, there were scattered reports, uh, you know, even in Greek and Roman authors, as well as in Arabic authors, uh, even in Chinese authors, there were occasional <coughs> mentions, but really no. Uh, no great interest in the plant. The plant started to be focused of scientific inquiry on <clears throat> in 45. 
So a lot after, a lot after Open Open was by then very well known to uh, uh, European science and uh, science at large. So um, a little bit later, uh, as the plan became better known in Europe and elsewhere, including the United States, it was introduced into the pharmacopoeias of the various countries. The USP, the United States Pharmacopoeia, introduced it in 1854. Uh, European countries were more or less at the same time. When it stayed till about 1942, and it was listed, uh, I have actually a couple of them at home, and we listed as an analgesic, as, a, as a, an antispasmodic, and uh, antitussive against cough. Um, not prominently, not as prominently as the opiates, for example, but was there. So it was a little bit surprising that, it, you know, in the midst of this, it should be, kind of, it should become illegal. But that's exactly what happened. There was no real scientific motivation. You know, the cannabis plant was sold as an extract in all pharmacies in the, throughout the Union and you know in Europe. And then in 1937, uh, we're under the FDR administration here. We have the Marijuana Tax Act, which literally, uh, out of the blue, illegalized it, criminalized it. So. Uh, I could have a separate lecture on this and why this happened and what it means, uh, but today I will not go there. I'll, I'll just say a few things about the impact that this had. One thing that this, that this caused was the fact that everything came very, came out very slowly. All the science occurred because you can't stop science, that's a good thing, but you can slow it down if you like, and that's what it did. It, this legislation slowed down the uh, uh, characterization of the properties of cannabis, because if you were to compare uh, the same timeline for morphine, everything would be faster by about 50 to 100 years. So it's, it's a little slower, but you get, we get pretty much to the same place. So as you can imagine, the first thing was to discover the active ingredients, right? What is the reason why people used the plant? What was the, you know, the chemical ingredient responsible? for the uh, biological activity of the plant. And this happened in, 20, in a 20 year period that goes from 44 to 64. In 44, a man by the name of Roger Adams, you may not know him, but he was one of the greatest uh, chemists uh, in this country. And uh, he basically had the structure of the THC there, but he didn't quite uh, know where the double bond, the key double bond was, and he couldn't because he didn't have an MR machine and nuclear magnetic resonance machine, but in 64, that became available, and Rafi Mishulam in, uh, in Israel was able to uh, identify that crucial double bond, which is the Delta-9 double bond. That's why tetrahydrocannabinol is called Delta-9, tetrahydrocannabinol, Delta-9 THC. So this is really a lengthy discovery period that ended up with the identification of what was thought to be then the active ingredient so let me explain what I mean by that. What is an active ingredient? So if you take a plant, say opium, you extract it and uh, you inject it in an animal, let's say a dog, when you see the dog goes to sleep. Then if you take the same plant and you start so, you know, separating different components and you inject the first and the second and the third, the first and the second won't do anything, but the third will put the dog to sleep. And that is exactly what people did with THC. They were actually using dogs. The animals' dogs are very, uh, very uh, sensitive to THC. They have a lot of cannabinoid receptors in their cerebellum. So the first thing that happens if you give some cannabis to a dog, don't try it. But if you do, they, they will lose their equilibrium, their balance. They will just fall over, and um, it's easy, easy enough. So people were I mean, doing that experiment, and they fractionated more and more isolated by you know various photography means and eventually identified that this particular compound here was responsible for the uh, uh, overt pharmacological effect, not the subtle pharmacological effect, but the overt pharmacological effect. So it's a very sort of a, um, uh, it, it is a blunt tool. This is not a very subtle tool, but it's something that gets us to the, what is the driver, the driving force behind a certain pharmacology, right? So THC is the driving force behind the pharmacology of cannabis, and we'll talk a little bit more about other potential uh, drivers or modulators of that. 
So uh, we're in 1970 now, this is the Nixon administration, and uh, that's when the CSA, the Controlled Substance Act, was enacted, and they're comparing the legality of cannabis. And please note that here, this is all we knew by then, the THC was responsible for the effects of cannabis, that's all we knew. There was no other information on the biology of cannabis. That was it. We knew uh, pretty much uh, that it was psychoactive, it produced certain effects, it was fairly mild in its, uh, in its uh, psychoactivity, but that's uh, pretty much all we knew. So there is no, um, again, no scientific reason here to do what the CSA did, which was to take cannabis and make it one of the most dangerous illegal substances that we can think of. Because that's what it is, cannabis is scheduled, it's scheduled one substance, which means that it's as bad as heroin. Um, well, you can draw your own conclusions, but the argument that there was science behind this is just not an argument. There was no science behind this decision, and I think that's, that's a, an important thing to say. Now again, this, the, the politics here slowed down the science. So we actually had to wait more than 20 years before we got from the discovery of THC to the discovery of the cell surface receptors that are present on neurons and other cells in the body that are responsible for the effects of THC, the receptors to which THC binds and cause, causes therefore intracellular changes. Those are the cannabinoid receptors that belong to family of receptors called G-prod and couple receptors. I'll say a few more things about that later on. But basically, these receptors trail after the opioid receptors, after the dopamine receptors. They trail again because the politics was making the work, uh, scientific work, slower. But eventually we got that. This was work done by, uh, initially by a group of Alan Howitt, and then by a group at NIH that cloned the receptors in any So scientists, when they have a receptor, you know what they think. What is it activating this receptor normally, right? Because although we have dealt with cannabis for a long time, 8,000 years is not enough in terms of mutation time to create mutations and a new entire new receptor system. So uh, uh, there must be an endogenous system that activates these receptors, and that is the endocannabinoid system. And it was discovered between 92 and 1999. Um, so now we are 2018, and all of a sudden, literally, all of a sudden, cannabis is being legalized everywhere. It's legalized medically in most states of the union, either completely or as CBD. Is legalized uh, recreationally in nine states of the Union. And we're now paying the price for having been so slow in our research, in our scientific endeavors, because we have so many questions that we need to ask and we don't have enough answers for them. And I hope that I, at the end of the, if at the end of my talk, you will have, you will be excited enough to pursue this exciting field of research you might be able to contribute to some of those answers. Okay, so the bottom line, really, if you remember one thing in my lecture, this is the thing that I'd like you to remember. This is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. This is the famous delta-9 double bond. This is delta-9 THC, how it works. It works by binding to and activating the receptors in the brain and elsewhere in the body that are called cannabinoid receptors. This is really the pharmacology that is driving the effects of cannabis. So if they tell you, what about CBD? What about CBA? What about CB whatever? The answer is all this play a role, but this role is around the protagonist here, that is THC. And here are the two models. Uh, Pain and molecular modeling, so you take them with a big grain of salt of the cannabinoid receptors, the, the membrane would be, of course, here, right? 
regarding our play in the system, we have the transmembrane domains, uh, extracellular, intracellular domains, and there are two subtypes. This is the one that is really most relevant to the psychological activity, the intoxicating ability of cannabis, the ability to cause the high, right? And to probably the 90%, if not 95%, of the effects of THC. This is uh, another receptor that was cloned uh, three years after the CB1 receptor, named uh, the very, uh, very friendly, with a lot of fantasy, uh, CB2. So this guy here actually only shares about 40% homology with CB1, and uh, uh, it's completely different localization. Yeah, both are G protein coupled receptors in that there must be somewhere here in the intracellular domain some G proteins that interact with it that are responsible for transducing, transducing the mechanism intracellularly. But uh, um, they're very different otherwise. As I said, only 40% homology. And this guy here is present very abundantly in the brain, uh, but also elsewhere in the body. Pretty much in every single organ system we have, there are cannabinoid CB1 receptors. In the brain, there is a ton of them, a ton of them. Actually, it's the single most abundant gibberellin couple receptor that we have. There are areas like this, the corpus striatum, where it's 12 times more abundant than the opiate receptor, four times more abundant than the dopamine D2 receptor. Why on earth do we have so much cannabinoid CB1 receptors? Nobody knows. But it's certainly an interesting question. It's a question that I think eventually we'll, we'll find an answer to. But at lower levels, you can find it everywhere in the body, even in places where we do not expect them. For example, in liver cells, in fat cells. Why would we have this receptor in liver and fat cells? Turns out, actually, that the endocannabinoid system is very important outside the brain. Now, so this is a truly ubiquitous receptor. What about the CB2? Well, the CB2 is localized very selectively to cells of the immune system. So innate and adaptive immune cells, for example, macrophage, B lymphocytes. Now, the fact that it's such a selective localization should not fool you, because macrophages or macrophage are really very abundant everywhere. In every organ system, you have about 10, 15% of the cells are made up of, uh, of these resident macrophages. And um, so in both CB1 and CB2 are, at the end of the day, throughout, present throughout the body. And this means that uh, cannabis can really affect all these different organ systems because it can, through THC, activate all these receptors. Just to get a sense of where the cannabis receptor is in the brain, I, I prefer to use this sort of scheme, you know, where the density, the, you know, the, the, the color reflects the density of the cannabis receptor. To show you how abundant and how pervasive this receptor system is, you can find it in a whole lot of different places. And when you have this color here, it means that there is very little. And in this particular area here that I have uh, you know, highlighted, there is very, very little. And the reason why I highlighted it is because this is the so-called pre botzinger complex, which is involved in the regulation of respiration. And you, know, you probably know that one reason why people die of opiate overdose is because they stop breathing. And the reason why they stop breathing is because in these brainstem nuclei here, which include the pre your complex, there are a lot of mu opioid receptors that regulate the breathing rhythm. And uh, of course with morphine, you just, or heroin, you just completely, or fentanyl, you completely knock it off. And people stop breathing and they die. And there are no cannabinoid receptors here, zero. And that, that is one reason why it's almost impossible to kill people with cannabis. Uh, in fact, it is impossible to kill people with cannabis. Uh, you can screw them up quite a bit for a couple of days, but you can't kill them. And that's, that's always, uh, what do I say, you know, when, you are, when, when you're concerned about a, an overdose of cannabis, just wait and relax and try not to panic. It will go away. It will go away. You just need to wait and not panic. Two things are not easy, even more easily said than done. But that's what it is, that's the truth. So um, how does it work? It's in all these different places. Why is it, it's everywhere. Why is it everywhere in the brain? Well, one reason is because these things here are everywhere in the brain. This is a synapse. So this is the really where the action is in the brain. 
there is a, a you know two neurons talk to one another using this uh, junctions where there's a presynaptic component containing uh, these codes here full of the uh, transmitter. When an actual potential arrives here, calcium floods the presynaptic boton, the transmitter gets released, finds receptors on, the, on this component here, which is attached to a different neuron, and this is called the postsynapse, and these receptors you know, become activated, and uh, this turns into another um, potential, not an actual potential, but another sort of potential that travels to the, the cell body of the postsynaptic, I'm sorry, the postsynaptic cell. <clears throat> so, this is where cannabinoid receptors are. In a variety of cells, you know, of neurons in the brain, glutamatergics, glutamatergic neurons, which are excitatory, GABAergic neurons, which are inhibitory, serotonergic, dopaminergic, a lot of these neurons have CB1 receptors right here. As you can see depicted here, this is not actually an artist's imagination. This is where the receptors are in this sort of ring that surrounds the, uh, the presynapse. And that's a very important location, as we will see maybe later on. I don't know if I go there. But anyway, maybe it's an important location because cannabinoids, endocannabinoids are produced here. And so they travel quickly, they get to activate the cannabinoid receptor. These are the, the famous G proteins I told you about. These are the transducing proteins intracellularly, and G proteins uh, then open or close uh, ion channels. In this case, they close a calcium channel, so less calcium comes in, less transmitter is released. So you have a phenomenon we technically call presynaptic inhibition. So if this is a glutamatergic neuron that releases an excitatory transmitter, glutamate, the net result of activating this receptor Will be a decrease in glutamate release, so it would be an inhibitory effect. If you instead have the receptor in a neuron, in a synapse that releases GABA, which is an inhibitory transmitter, well then you will have a disinhibition, so an excitation. So you can imagine you do this throughout the brain at one time, and that's where you end up with intoxication, or a high, or being stoned. <coughs> it's a global activation of all cannabinoid receptors concomitantly. Now, what about the, the endocannabinoids, brain on cannabis? Well, that's uh, what they do. And these are some of the functions that they have been shown to underpin. Um, I'm going to quickly go through some of them, but this makes a lot of logical sense, right? Um, one of the few things that everybody experiences, all of our friends, that indulge <laughs> experience it is, is the munchies, right? That's really quite, in fact, quite consistent. Uh, emotion, <clears throat> of course, you, you know, euphoria, a sense of a sense of well-being, is experienced often by some people. Not necessarily all. Some people actually are panic when they when they use cannabis. It's a minority, but some do. And relief of pain. Um, there is an obvious cognitive impairment, particularly the short-term memory uh, associated with the, during activation of cannabinoid receptors, and reward, of course, the, ple the pleasantness of activating cannabinoid receptors, something that you, 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 you know is experienced by those who use it. And the, all these different functions are functions in which the endocannabinoid system is naturally involved. So obviously, what is happening is not that the endocannabinoids are constantly activating all the neurons and neural systems that underpin these functions, otherwise we would be constantly high. That's not what happens. What happens is that amounts, small amounts of endocannabinoids are being produced at the right time, in the right place, and the net result is, you know, that we have changes in, uh, in feeding, emotion, pain, inflammation, and reward, etc. So these are all uh, very well-tuned mechanisms. So. What activates cannabinoid receptors? What are these endocannabinoids? There are two main endocannabinoids. An anamide, which is a fatty acid ethanolamide, so it's a, a, a fatty acid combined with an ethanolamine moiety, and two arachidonic glycerol, which is a, a, a glycerol ester of arachidonic acid. So how can we, sorry, how can we uh, modulate this system? That is, how can we intervene? I'm gonna go now on the more of the pharmacology of the, of the system 
and ask the question, how can we uh, modulate the system in a way that is therapeutically useful? Um, and the answer is in a number of different ways. But let me start off with the cannabinoid receptors. How can we modulate the cannabinoid receptor? We have multiple, so this is CB1 receptor, first of all. We have multiple options, but the first one is activating the receptor. And to do that, we need receptor agonists. That's why that's what in the lingo of, of pharmacology, you call a ligand, something that binds to a receptor that has activating properties. It's a, an agonist ligand. And you can have ligands that do not fully activate the receptor, they're called partial agonists. And in, interestingly, the endogenous ligand itself is a partial agonist, it does not fully activate the receptor. And even THC itself is a partial agonist. It does not fully activate the receptor. Mind you, we're not talking about potency here. We are, about, we are talking about the ability to fully activate the receptor. And uh, that is independent of the potency. You can have full activation at 100 micromolar or full activation at 100 nanomolar. I don't care. No matter the dose you use, an NMI or the concentration you apply, an NMI that she will never be able to fully activate CP1. That's why they're called partial agonists. Sorry. I, and this is another way of showing this. This is the partial. So while well, we do have full agonists, and the other cannabinoid, endocannabinoid, which is a full agonist, we even have super agonists. For example, this is an, a synthetic molecule made in the lab, CP55940, one of the first molecules to be made. We didn't even know about cannabinoid receptors when we invented. In fact, it was used to discover cannabinoid receptors. And this guy is so potent, in fact, is even stronger than the maximal activation. So it forces the receptor into a confirmation that is abnormally active. And that's really kind of weird. In fact, you know, a little, little anecdote as several years ago, I was in the lab and I was making, doing an experiment and I dissolved CP55940 in the MSO. And then accidentally, a drop of the MSO, the CP55, fell on my hand and I wasn't wearing gloves. Med GLPs, anyway, med laboratory practices. I'll tell you, it went through my system right away, and I it, it was it was an awful sensation. It was a dysphoria that had nothing to do with you know the sensation that you feel when you use DHC. It's completely different. Very 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 strong. So I don't know which animal one, but it's an interesting thing about you know. The other thing you could do, you could maximally activize, activate, <laughs> super maximally activate, but you also can also modulate. And how do you modulate? Let's say that you have a compound which per se is unable to do anything on the receptor. Now you throw in the normal agonist, let's say an anamide, and now you can enhance this effect. So if your receptor is normally not activated, but you throw in this allosteric modulator, when the receptor gets to be activated, the effect is a lot higher. I know that's, that, that's an interesting concept because pharmacologically it's very, it could be very useful because you give these class of molecules and you're not activating the receptor, but when the endocannabinoid signal is produced, now the receptor becomes hyperactive, so responds more. So if the receptor is doing something good, for example, causing analgesia, when you use an allosteric modulator, it would enhance the normal analgesic effect of an endocannabinoid without really um, creating them per se. You have a question over there? Is there like an upper limit to how strong the effect could be if you use an allosteric modulator? Agonist? Like, can it only go to the full? Yeah. The full effect, or can you get up to like super? No, typically it goes into the full. Typically it goes into the full. We don't really understand very much the super agonism thing, but it's something that uh, it stresses that receptors are not potatoes. Receptors are not some kind of, you know, you imagine them some kind of a potato sitting there. No, they're very mobile and plastic little machines. All right, so what about, uh, so what have we learned from this? We have learned that we have, you know, if we use a partial agonist, we can have some therapeutic effects. Let me remind you that despite the CSA, the 
rose up since act of 1970. The are there are medications that contain THC. One of them is Marinol, it's a Schedule Three compound. Another one is Syndros, which is a Schedule Two compound. And of course, in states of the union where it's legal, you can use cannabis. And what we have learned is that there are CNS-based side effects. So you will be maybe surprised by my following statement, but although I work on cannabis, and sometimes I'm perceived by people as being maybe an advocate for the medicinal use of cannabis, I'm actually not. I think that cannabis is not a very uh, easy drug to use. Uh, I, I think is uh, it for the people to it, for, for whom it's useful, I think it's a great thing. If it's useful to them, it's okay with me. But it, as it, you know, uh, as a scientist, it's hard for me to use it because it has a very narrow therapeutic index. So, the, if you are using it, for example, medicinally to have painkilling, uh, it's very easy to over, over overstep and go into a place where now you have some euphoria, some high, and even some dysphoria. That's why I think it, you know it's a it's a very difficult drug to use. I think it has a place in therapy, but I think it's a good, difficult drug to use, and this is what we have learned, I think, from this. Again, uh, that doesn't mean that we should uh, not use it. It means that there's a lot more that we can do to uh, get better drugs based on what cannabis is teaching us. So what about full agonists and super agonists? Well, we know that they have major CNS-based side effects. I told you my little story here. What about allosteric modulators? Well, we don't know much. They're promising, but more work is needed. So there is a lot of pharmacology even here on cannabinoid receptor agonists that needs to be done. So um, one way to, uh, and this is kind of gets you to the thing of how pharmacologists thinks about these matters, one way to super uh, or, or circumvent the, 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 uh, the problem of the CNS-based side effects is saying, okay, why don't I use cannabinoid receptor doesn't enter into the brain, doesn't enter the brain. And you can say, why do you want to do that? You know, the, all the receptors are in the brain. No, I told you, the receptors are in the brain, in larger amounts, but there are also receptors outside the brain. And, uh, um, and so one way to do it, it would be to create peripheral agonists that uh, only activate the peripheral receptors. And it, it turns out that the peripheral cannabinoid receptors are involved in pain regulation, are involved in appetite regulation, are involved in, in the regulation of uh, uh, lipid metabolism. And in fact, these this, uh, peripheral agonists work fairly well. However, they also have peripheral side effects. Not, not, not major, but they have some and they should be keep kept in mind. Uh, I, don't, I don't really want to go there. So uh, what about other ways of uh, working with the cannabinoid receptor? Another thing is to block the receptor, right? So using what we call receptor antagonists. And receptor antagonists come in different uh, forms. And uh, excuse me, I, this is really a lecture in pharmacology. They are neutral, they are inverse, and they are allosteric. Oh, wow. So many different things. Well, uh, let's walk through them. Neutral antagonists really, I know this is in so many guys. Neutral antagonists really only means that uh, the antagonist is going there in the site where normally the agonist binds, is occupying the site, and doesn't let the agonist come in. It's as simple as that. That's why it's neutral. An inverse agonist, on the other hand, goes to the very same site where the agonist goes but kicks, you know, it elbows uh, uh, the, the receptor in such a way that now the receptor becomes deactivated. <coughs> you have to imagine that there is always some baseline activation. These receptors, even when they don't have an agonist bound to them, are still binding to G-proteins, are still causing some sort of trickle of an effect. And what the inverse agonists do, they come in, they elbow the receptor in such a way that it will actually stop doing that little that it normally does. So these are called inverse agonists. Or you can have allosteric and biased modulators which don't bind where the normal agonist binds, which is the so-called orthosteric side, they bind in a different allosteric side. And by way of doing that, they modulate the effects of the receptor. I, I mentioned them to you before as allosteric, uh, uh, as allosteric uh, uh, agonists. Uh, so, but let me, explain a little bit more what is an allosteric and biomodulator. So, so CB1 and other receptors 
don't only activate one intracellular signaling pathway. They usually activate more than probably three or four, but let's say they activate two, right? And they, each of them does a separate thing in the cell. Let's say one goes to cyclic KFB, the other one goes to protein kinase, um, MAP kinase, for example. So uh, what an allosteric and a bias modulator does is to bias the receptor in such a way that will turn off one of the signaling pathways while not turning off another one. So this is very cool because if say that signaling pathway one is the bad one and signaling pathway two is okay, if you use, if you invent a, a bias modulator that has this particular effect here, turning one off and not turning the other one off, well, what you end up having is a very, very selective, a hyper-selective antagonist because it's not blocking good and bad, it's only blocking the bad. Now, this is a concept so far, and we still don't have, uh, we, we have some uh, evidence, but we still don't have any of these guys are in the clinic, for example. So it's something to be watched, but I think something quite interesting and important. So what have we learned for the antagonists? Well, for the antagonists, we learned something a lot, because actually, you may not know this, or you may, but cannabinoid receptor antagonists have been tested in humans. In fact, this class of receptor signal antagonists has been tested quite extensively. They've been in the market in Europe, and they've been in front of the FDA, Food and Drug Administration, for approval in the United States, and they were rejected eventually in the United States, and they were re withdrawn from the market in Europe. And the reason for this is because, again, of side effects. It turns out that this particular molecule, Limonavan, is a, a, a CB1 receptor in your sinus, is very effective in this condition called metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is just a name for the combination of obesity, cardiovascular disorder, and everything that follows from that, diabetes, etc. So this syndrome is um, basically 30% of the population has, them, has it, and uh, Monoban was very, very effective in curbing it. However, it came with uh, an, an inc dose dependent increase in irritability, in uh, anxiety, in uh, uh, depression, eventually also in societal ideation. And these are all things that can be explained based on the role that the endocannabinoid system serves in regulating mood. So, um, what have we learned from neutral antagonists? Nothing so far. And what about these guys? Again, nothing so far, but these are two guys that we need to keep an eye on. I'm going to sc skip this because I don't think it's really that important. And I'm going to just briefly mention this. So um, we could play the same game that we've done with CP1 receptors, CP1 receptor agonists with the antagonists, and we could ask the question what happens if we block their ability to enter the CNS? Because their main side effects are mediated by the CNS, that kind of makes all the sense, doesn't it? So in fact, it would be nice to test peripheral antagonists, which turn out to be effective in animal models, in humans, because these guys don't need to block the cannabinoid receptor in the brain, they need to just to block the cannabinoid receptor outside the brain, so in, uh, in the gut, in, in the liver, in the, in the adipose tissue. And so if they don't enter the CNS, they will not cause the depress depression anxiety, etc., caused by uh, the standard compounds which enter the CNS. Well, the CB2 receptors, let's move on to this new receptor here. Uh, they, as I told you, they are in the immune cells, and uh, some stuff is known about CB2. Uh, if you activate it, you find you know, activations with analgesic effects, and it's also tissue protective. And there are very few cannabinoid CB2 receptors in the brain, and they're not on neurons, they're on microglia. So they are not psychoactive. The CB2 ions are not psychoactive. However, really, um, uh, we don't have very good tools to study these receptors, and that's why I, I think that CB2 receptors are really, to use this expression that was of uh, Oscar Wilde, a sphinx wrapped in a mystery. We discovered them over 20 years ago, 21 years ago this year, and not 25 years ago this year, and we are still we still don't really know what function they serve, and that's mainly because we don't have a lot of very good tools to study them. It's also possible that they have no role. 
I don't think that everything in nature serves a role. So let's talk a little bit about these endocannabinoids, anandamide and 2 ag I'm going to just activate this because otherwise I have to go back and forth. So think about this for a second. We have 14 serotonin receptors in the brain, 14, one four, and one transmitter serotonin. We have five or six dopamine receptors in the brain and one transmitter dopamine, one molecule, six receptors. And here we have one receptor, CB1, because CB2, I told you, is maybe an immune receptor, and we have two transmitters. That's kind of weird. Weirdness is really the endocannabinoid system, and I have a way of calling it. It's really a weird system. And you know, I just want to, want to point out what the difference are between Twitchy and Anamide. And they're interesting. Twitchy is what we call a point-to-point -point messenger. So it goes very close, it's producing one place, doesn't go that far, bounces the cannabinoid receptor, and the point-to-point -point is between the postsynaptic and the presynaptic. So to a G is produced postsynaptically, goes back to the presynapse, and as I told you before, it stops the release of transmitter. And because this type of mechanism is present throughout the brain, has many functions in the CNS and also in the periphery, many different functions. With an enamide, we have a different situation. An enamide actually is more of a modular transmitter. So it's released in point A and travels for a further, farther away from point A, not too far, a few hundreds of microns, maybe a few millimeters, but it travels far enough to now bind to receptors on neurons that are farther away, as well as on glia receptors. And um, so it's, we call it a modulatory transmitter. It's also called the volume transmitter in the sense that it spreads across a certain volume around the site where it is produced. The functions that an enamide is stopped to serve in the brain are a lot more limited than 2AG. We, for example, we highlight a couple of things. Social behavior and stress response in the CNS and pain in the periphery. And again, these are very, very important functions because they explain also the side effects of the, the CB1 antagonist. If you block a mechanism that is involved in helping in the stress response and coping with stress, you end up having anxiety, depression. Uh, another side effect of uh, the cannabinoid antagonist was hyperalgesia, increased pain, and it's because the endocannabinoids are involved in the periphery, and anamide is involved in pain control. So can we play with these signals? Can we do better molecules than cannabis can? You know, cannabis, cannabis and THC can? I think we can, and that's one of the things that I try to do in my, in my lab. Um, let me just show you how these compounds are, are, are produced and destroyed. First of all, they are, again, in this also they are weird. If you think, if you remember from biology, from neuroscience, if you ever studied or biochemistry, you remember that transmitters are stored in synaptic vesicles. And that's not the way these compounds are stored. They are actually stored as precursors in cell membranes. This was our first discovery back in '94, and uh, there, was a, there are precursors for endocannabinoids that are inactive, and then the signal arrives, and usually calcium, some kind of activity-dependent signal, and now click, an enzyme comes in, clips the, the lipid precursor, and out they go. The biologically active endocannabinoids are produced, they travel to the cannabinoid receptor, activate the receptor, and then they're rapidly metabolized, metabolized. And there's a whole host of metabolite of uh, enzymes that does that. Uh, some are more famous than others. Uh, and the metabolites can be inactive or could be active by uh, other mechanisms. So the pathway actually extends if the enzymes that metabolize the endocannabinoids are not just pure and simple deactivating enzymes, but actually activating enzymes. So how can we play with this, with drugs, to make this uh, good for therapy? Well, one thing that we have done, uh, and uh, others have done, we have, been, we have learned ways to block the deactivation of the endocannabinoids to enhance the, their activity. So if normally they sort of are analgesic, by blocking that deactivation, we make a better analgesic drug, an analgesic drug that works on our own system instead of coming from outside. And the idea here is again, is exactly as I was saying, it obtain greater selectivity, safety, 
then they don't be right that thing agonists. You know, one right, rule in pharmacology, agonists don't make good drugs. Agonists don't make good drugs. If you look in the pharmacology textbook, not very many agonists. A few, usually with a lot of side effects. Very, very few. Antagonists make good drugs, or these indirect agonists make good drugs. I think one of uh, these indirect agonists uh, every day is called omeprazole. It's, a, it's something that blocks the degradation of something. And uh, anyway, that's okay. Uh, so uh, I'm going to skip this because it's too long and I don't want to bother you with this. Okay, so we talked about THC, we talked about the endocannabinoid system. Do you have any questions about that? No, too bad. Because <laughs> I have so many answers. There. <laughs> <laughs> now, outside the, the, the THC, what, what else is in cannabis? A ton of different stuff. There are about 120 cannabinoids in cannabis. The, uh, it's a complex, uh, complex uh, secondary metabolism. And uh, what do they do? Well, there is um, the first thing, one thing you need to remember, and that's, that, that's really important here. THC is a CB, it's the only cannabinoid receptor agonist. The others are not cannabinoid receptor agonists. Cannabinol has a tiny affinity for CB1 receptors, but THC is the cannabinoid receptor agonist. So, what about the other famous cannabinoid, cannabidiol or CBD? which now people want to put everywhere in water and food and chocolate. And, and my question is, why? Because it, we know that cannabidiol has several pharmacological effects, but um, some of them are good. For example, it, it, it was recently approved as uh, a drug for the treatment of uh, this form of uh, uh, childhood epilepsy called Bradley syndrome. Um, but these effects, which are not mediated by cannabinoid receptors, certainly do not justify uh, its use as a sort of a uh, health supplement. It, it makes no sense to me. Um, and, and I'm actually a little bit concerned about that. Anyway, so aside from THC and CBD, there are 118 other cannabinoids known as of today, but their effects are really unknown. There are a handful really of papers, maybe a total of 50 papers published on these over 100 uh, cannabinoids, so we don't really know what they do. So in the last couple of minutes, I'm gonna go over this pretty quickly. Uh, I, let me see, maybe I'll skip some of this. Well, let me just tell you a little bit, and, and, and then you can decide whether you're interested or not. Um, because this, is, this material is available actually online. Uh, so a couple of years ago, in the end of 2016, National Academy of, of Science convened a, 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 a committee to study the impact of uh, the health impact of cannabis and cannabinoids. And um, the charge of the committee was to really come to a consensus, a uh, field consensus on uh, what was known at the time, which was all the, all the way to the end of 2016. And in 2017, a report was published. So we did a little bit about this committee. It was a 16 member panel. Uh, assisted by the staff and uh, looked at 24,000 primary studies uh, in the period 99 to 2016. And this was chosen because the National Academy had published a, a, a previous report in 99. Okay, so 24,000 primary studies. Well, the committee I, I was a member of focused on systematic reviews, uh, which is something very, very specific. It produced a 468-page report with 15 conclusions and four recommendations. So if you have a question <clears throat> and you wonder, uh, is cannabis good for something, just go to the National, National Academy of Science, Science with, uh, page and uh, uh, download the uh, conclusions and the recommendations, and you will know what science thought as of this as of 2017, now a year later, Things have not changed very, very much. But these are some of the things that uh, were, I mean, these are the things that were looked into uh, as health effects of cannabis. And very briefly, I'd like to go over a few of them just to give you a sense of how, in, uh, how interesting is science, how science works. Okay, we sometimes think that science are logical. We are. We try to be logical. However, logic is not, it's just a tool. Because it, it, what matters are just the data. And sometimes the data defy logic, as I will show you in a couple of minutes. 
So when it comes to cancer, these things here, lung and, 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 and neck cancer, for example, were you know, almost as lined up. We knew that cannabis was smoked, so we assumed that since it was smoked, and smoked tobacco caused cancer, smoke, can smoke, smoke cannabis should also cause cancer, right? That's called the syllogism. Aristotle invented it. And we will still be, be back in the fifth century before, third century before, current year eight, we still believe the syllogism enough will take us places. In fact, it turns out that, large, that despite the logical conclusion, the data show that there is no association between cannabis smoke and lung cancer. There is association with emphysema, which is a form of COPD, uh, obstructive disorder of the lungs, but no, no cancer. Why is that? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. But that's these are what the data are. Now, all these other type of cancers, there is sufficient evidence. The only cancer for which there is evidence in support of an association is testicular cancer. But it's limited evidence. And don't forget, who gets testicular cancers? Young men in their 20s. And who, who smokes a lot of dope? Young men in their 20s. <coughs> so I, I think it could be just an association. Now, we do need more studies on this. Interestingly, our great state of California, which I love, but I'm especially now, uh, <laughs> has, however, a, a way of uh, screwing things up when it comes to this stuff. Prop 65, which is infamous because every Starbucks has got a Prop 65 warning that tells us that we're about to, we're about to die <laughs> from what we're going to taste. You know, the cappuccino contains poison. Now, Prop 65 also lists marijuana smoke as a carcinogen, which is in the clear contrast with the data. So that's unfortunately it's a problem because you know you stop believing in this type of stuff. I'm gonna skip over this because it's really too long. Now I want to just show you one thing here, and I was mentioning that to, to John. Uh, so because of the munchies, one would think that people who smoke a lot of pot end up being really overweight and maybe diabetic, right? Because they have what they like Twinkies, right? <laughs> Who doesn't like Twinkies anyway? <laughs> in fact, the opposite is true. For folks who use uh, regularly, there is limited evidence of, of an association between cannabis use and decreased risk of diabetes. So it is actually improving the overall metabolic phenotype, extended use. And that's again bizarre, but that's that's what it is. That's what it is. Now I don't want to go this is too long, but this I like to point out because it's of interest, it should be of interest to everybody. Unlike uh, what you hear sometimes on the internet, economists can, can do no harm, he can, because um, there is absolutely no uh, doubt in uh, among scientists that we call this substantial evidence, which is not conclusive, but is already a lot. Uh, of an association between ex extensive use of cannabis, especially early in life, with the development of schizophrenia. So, and these are many studies, all pointing in the same direction. So that is one thing that we one should be concerned about. Cannabis has been now strongly associated when it's used early on and in high amounts with the induction of schizophrenia. Now, to think to make things complicated in life nature and science have always a way of doing that. There is also evidence of an association that if you are a patient with schizophrenia, you're a person with schizophrenia, and you use cannabis, you actually have a better cognitive, cognitive behavior. You be, you, you, your cognition is better. And so you, you, you can almost imagine how complex this whole thing is, right? If you use a lot early on in life, you increase your risk of developing it, but if you develop it and now you're using it, it kind of makes you a little bit better. It, you kind of start to think that perhaps people use it early on in life to alleviate certain type of symptoms, and the more they use it, the more, the more they increase their risk of developing schizophrenia. So it is really a, a, almost a, um, a snake that is eating its own tail. Now, the good news is that about depression, suicide, and social anxiety is that there is 
either moderate evidence or very or very small evidence. This is not something that I would be uh, extremely concerned about. Something to keep in mind, but not something to of great concern. Uh, here are some therapeutic effects. There is either conclusive or substantial evidence that cannabis is effective in chronic pain, in chemotherapy-induced nausea, and in spasticity in MS. These are three conditions for which science is a pretty, pretty confident that cannabis or the cannabinoids work. I'm going to skip that. There is only moderate evidence of effectiveness for sleep apnea and sleep disturbance. So a lot of people use cannabis to assuage, to enter into a night of sleep, and that's understandable. However, the evidence for this is only moderate, and maybe further studies are needed. And there is also very limited, limited evidence of effectiveness in these other conditions, some of which are however quite interesting. For example, PTSD is a condition for which um, many, for example, soldiers or people who experience, experience trauma in childhood say that they use cannabis, makes them feel better, but the evidence now, the scientific evidence for effectiveness is still very limited. So I'd like to just give you a, a little bit of a, um, I'm going to go a little bit deeper, and I am a little late, I think, right? No, I meant in an hour now. So uh, we have another hour of discussion, right? We do downstairs, another place. We're going to stop here and then go to another room. Okay. Well, you know, uh, I, I started at 10, so I'll just go quickly over this. Actually, I'm going to skip it. I'm going to skip it. I don't want to give you too much. Uh, this is really other, uh, and we don't need the legal primer. I think I can stop right here. Let me just say that these are a couple of, uh, of therapeutic effects which you hear and you read about in the internet. So I want to make sure that you know that we have very limited evidence, we call it insufficient evidence, and in some cases even limited evidence of ineffectiveness, so evidence of the contrary of effectiveness. But cancers, my God, this is something I get emails every other day. Uh, does it work? You know, yeah, for God's sakes, please don't stop chemotherapy. Uh, and right, said so people will do crazy stuff. Epilepsy, well, we know that Epidal and CBD has been now approved, uh, but uh, for cannabis itself, the evidence is insufficient. ALS, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease. My God, and this actually made me an overnight viral <coughs> phenomenon. Book up, it, it did. I'm not proud of it. It just happened. So it happened that some uh, there was a, a gentleman that suffers from Parkinson's disease who had a uh, who had a, uh, a you know a Facebook blog whatever. So he was at his Facebook page when the, you know he showed you know his life as a Parkinson patient. One day he uh, he decided to try cannabis oil THC and to record all this with uh, in a movie in a video, which he did. And so he goes he shows up at the home with his, to his friend and his friend gives him gives him the THC. He puts it under his tongue, and you know, throughout all this period, this, this, this person is a Parkinson patient, so he's experiencing all these <clears throat> random movements. This is actually, it is not something that Parkinson causes, but something that the, uh, the drug you take for Parkinson, and dopa causes, it's called target dyskinesia. It, it is actually very kind of visible, strange movements, almost a like chorea. And, so he takes this, and almost instantly, you can see in front of your eyes, you know, it's recording. So in a matter of minutes, the symptoms disappear. He, uh, he lies on the, on a couch and goes into a nice restful sleep, and he wakes up, and, and that's it. The problem is that he decided to take an interview that I gave him to some radio station, TV station, and clip, and clip on my interview after this. So... Uh, this went viral, it had 55 million viewers. And my daughter was very excited for me. <laughs> Milan was getting excited by this stuff. I received like literally thousands of emails because they thought, people, viewers thought that I was the guy organizing this whole thing, right? So they wanted to know how much and blah, blah. I said, I can't help you, I'm sorry. But, but the point is that a lot of people out there just based on this one amazing episode, uh, we'll ask, still today, a couple of years later, is cannabis good for Parkinson's disease? And the answer is we do not know, just like we don't for any of these things here. 
With this, I think I'm going to close. I don't think you need a legal primer because you will have a, a section on, uh, on, on that. Let me just remind you, cannabis is a Schedule One drug, and this also includes CBD. This includes CBD, okay? Don't trust the New Yorker or any other magazine that says the opposite. New Yorker actually had a piece on this, saying, oh, CBD is legal because it's not psychotropic. Bullshit. It is completely, <laughs> completely uh, uh, illegal, and the ADD has made that very, very clear. Uh, guess what? The cultivation, possession, and sale of cannabis is a federal offense, which means that in this university, you cannot grow cannabis even for scientific purposes. We can't in my university, which is the sister UCI, uh, in spite of the fact that the, the cannabis uh, plan is itself legal in our own state, as well as in 20 other states in the District of Columbia. That's it. Come again? No, 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 no. Every, every university that receives federal funding is at risk of losing this fund funding if, uh, if either shown to possess, use, blah, blah, blah. Now, I'm not going to go over this. I stop right here. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you. Kevin. <laughs>